cops, all the cops are going to start patrolling and I'm going to pick all the speed cubes up. All the cops are going to go by within minutes. Then they got a pass right in the hall of the place.
one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the Lord. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, your ears are always open to the prayers of your humble servants, who come to you in Jesus' name. Teach us always to ask according to your will, that we may never fail to obtain the blessings you have promised. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Please be seated. We continue with him 409, Come My Soul with Every Care. What if the number of the righteous is five, 
less than 50. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks to you, God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 19. You'll find that on page 90 in the fourth part of the hymn book. Page 70, Psalm 19. We'll join together in singing the psalm. <coughs> Elijah was a man just like us. He 
prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah. Church, the communion of saints. 
What does this mean? We should fear and love God, that we do not take our neighbor's money or property or get it by dishonest dealing, but help him to improve and protect his property and means of income. The eighth commandment. You shall not give false testimonies against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God, that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, or give him a bad name, but defend him, speak well of him, and take his words and actions in the highest possible way. The ninth commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? We should fear and love God, that we do not seem to get our neighbor's inheritance or house, or obtain it by a short right, but do all we can to help him keep it. The tenth commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, workers, animals, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not force or entice away our neighbor's spouse, <coughs> workers, or animals, but urge them to stay and do their duty. Please be seated. Our next hymn is hymn 435, The Will of God is Always Better.
our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it was July 16, 1945. The first successful atomic bomb testing had just taken place. And after seeing the absolutely devastating blast out there in the desert, the chief scientist Robert Oppenheimer was reminded of a uh, quote from a Hindu text that said, Now I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. That quote was immortalized not because it was part of an ancient Hindu scripture verse, but because he was reminded of it after seeing an atomic bomb go off. And just less than a month after this, it was used on people. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed in Japan, and over 200,000 people were killed in the bombing. Now after seeing such hellish destruction, people would be forced to ask, why in the world was that necessary? Could there ever be a reason for doing this to other people? The crazy part is that there was a reason. You see, they were estimating that if we have to end the war with Japan, it would require invading the Japanese mainland, and that would have resulted in at least a million people dying. And so instead, they dropped the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those people died, and the wicked Japanese empire was brought to its knees, and the war was ended early. Now, while this isn't the first, or while this was the first time that atomic weapons had been used on human beings, it wasn't the first time that two cities had been utterly vaporized for a just cause. In our lesson for today, we hear about how the Lord's will is done. Our story picks up where our recent Old Testament lesson left off. God and two angels had taken the form of man, and they had come to visit Abraham and his wife Sarah, and they had told Abraham and his wife that you will have a child in your old age. And after they had finished their meal that Abraham had set out for them, they get up to go on their way. And Abraham walks along with them so that he can see them on their journey. And as they're walking along, they look down into the valley and they see the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's when the Lord says this. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. From there, the two angels that were with them go down into the valley to go to one of the cities, and now Abraham is left there, up on the hilltop, standing before the Lord, one on one. And as Abraham is sitting there looking down at those two cities that are about to be destroyed, his heart goes out to them, specifically to the believers that live in those cities. And so he says, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham recognized what was on the line here. And so his heart goes out to these people and he asks God to spare the city for the sake of the righteous people. And when God says yes and promises to spare it, Abraham asks a total of five more times. And every single time, the Lord says, for the sake of that number of people, I will spare the city. Meanwhile, as this is going on, the two angels have now
now entered the city of Sodom. The sun is setting. They don't have a place to stay, and they're preparing to sleep out in the city square for the night. When, out of nowhere it seems, Abraham's nephew Lot, who lives in the city, comes and sees these two men and offers to open up his house to them. He says, you do not want to spend the night in the city square. Come to my house. And while he's entertaining these two men as guests in his house that evening, we're told that men from every part of the city, rich and poor, young and old, come to the house. They pound on Lot's door and they demand that he bring out his house guests so that that angry mob can sleep with them. Lot says no. And surprisingly, Lot even offers them his own daughters instead of these men, hoping that that would placate the crowd. But instead, they become more and more violent until the angels strike the crowd with blindness. And as all those men in that crowd start feeling their way back home, the angels tell Lot and his family that the Lord is about to destroy this city and you need to leave right now. So Lot and his family run for the hills, and as they be, are now a safe distance away, the sun is rising on those cities for the last time. As God rains down burning sulfur from heaven onto those two cities. Now if you're listening closely, there are two things about this story that don't make any sense. One. Why in the world does God need to go down into those cities to see how bad things really are? Isn't he all-knowing? God went down there to see those cities, not for his own benefit, but for ours. After all, think of just like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when those cities got bombed, people asked why. Why would this be necessary? Well... There are plenty of people who love to criticize the God of the Old Testament and say, why in the world was this or that necessary? And so by sending those angels into the city and giving us a sneak peek of what that place was actually like, God shows us the reason for destroying those cities. Those people were awful, and they had it coming. The other thing that doesn't make any sense is that when God says, I will go down and see if what they say about this place is true, Abraham immediately jumps to the conclusion that God is going to destroy the city, even though God doesn't actually say, if it's that bad, then I'll destroy it. So why would Abraham jump to the conclusion and immediately start asking that the place be spared when God doesn't actually say, I will destroy it? Because he knows who God is. He knows who God is, and he knows that God is righteous, perfect, and holy, and that God cannot tolerate sin. And Abraham also knows what's down there in those cities. And he knows that when God and those cities collide, something's got to give. And it's not going to be God. What's fascinating about all of this is that as Abraham is standing there before the Lord, the Lord has, in a sense, approached him first, you know, coming to the place where he lives to talk to him. And now Abraham is approaching God in prayer. He recognizes that it is now him coming to God when he speaks. So he says that I am nothing but dust and ashes. Where would we fit into this narrative? If we suddenly got inserted into the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where would we be? Would we be in Abraham's sandals up there on the hill standing before the Lord? If we're being honest, we would be down in those cities. You might be asking why. Why would we be considered part of those cities down in the valley? After all, homosexuality is just a small percentage of the population. What, how could that apply to us? Brothers and sisters, Sodom and Gomorrah had plenty of other problems. The 
prophet Ezekiel says it like this in chapter 16. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and the needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore I did away with them as you have seen. This is the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. Does it sound familiar? Brothers and sisters, you and I are living in our own Sodom and Gomorrah right here in the United States of America. Our nation just celebrated Gay Pride Month, and while we may not have joined in with the celebration, we have our own problems. How many of us love to sit back on our smartphones or our computers and complain about how the other half of the population is ruining the country for us. And as we sit there on our smartphones and our computers, have we ever wondered how that device wound up in our hands? <clears throat> of course we go to the store and we buy it, but before that it's assembled by a depressed Chinese factory worker with nothing to live for. And it probably contains cobalt that was mined by kids in the Congo. I'm not saying it's wrong for us to own a smartphone or a computer, but have we recognized or understood just how actually, literally overfed we are? and how unconcerned we are with the plight of the poor and the problems in our world. We may not have celebrated Gay Pride Month with the rest of the country, but we make our own compromises, right? Just like Lot, who offered his daughters to that vile mob, you and I, we make our own compromises. We tell ourselves, it's okay if I do A, B, and C, because it's not as bad as X, Y, or Z. Brothers and sisters, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord hears the outcry against the United States. He sees the injustice that each and every one of us either participate in or benefit from. And the Lord is appalled. And the Lord will take action. He took action for Sodom and Gomorrah, and he took action on a level that you could compare to an atomic bomb. There are some people out there who theorize that the Dead Sea Valley is the barren wasteland that it is because of what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Think of how serious that sin was for God to reach his hand into human affairs and intervene in such a direct way. It's the third most drastic punishment that God has ever given in all of the scripture. The second most drastic punishment would be the flood. But what was the first? The number one most drastic punishment that God ever gave in all of time was punishing his son for the sins of the whole world. God gave the punishment that we deserve to his son so that we no longer are doomed to suffer what our sins deserve. God sent his son to suffer and die in our place and to rise from the dead so that you and I will too. We now have peace with God, and our sins no longer separate us from our God. <clears throat> when Jesus died, the curtain in the temple was torn in half. And that signified that our sins no longer separate us from our God. Just as God sent angels into Sodom and Gomorrah to rescue Lot and his family, God has sent his son to rescue us. Jesus came here and lived a life as a human being so that he can take us away from our own death and destruction and 
bring us to stand up on that hill with Abraham. Bring us to stand before the Lord. Do we even wrap our head around how crazy that is? It's a turnaround that is so shocking, impossible, and unexpected, it leaves us speechless. Imagine if you're walking downtown, and suddenly a limousine pulls up. Two men in suits get out, and they forcefully but gently make you get into the limousine and sit you down next to the President of the United States. How would you react? What do you want with me? Why am I here? Why are you here? What is going on? What's about to happen? There'd be so many questions we'd have. And yet that is what Jesus did for each and every one of us, pulling us away from our own death and destruction to stand before the Lord. And now we're left wondering, what right do I have to stand before you? The answer is simple. Jesus' death and resurrection. That's why we get to stand before the Lord. And as we stand there before the Lord, just like Abraham, we're left wondering, now what? So, just like Abraham, let's pray. Let's come and approach the Lord in prayer. So many fascinating things things about Abraham's prayer to God. We hear he, he, he seems to recognize that he's treading on thin ice here, right? Well, now that I'm so bold as to speak to the Lord, hear me one last time. You always feel or get the sense that he's kind of inching out just a little bit closer and closer to the point of no return. It's understandable though, right? After all, what happens when a child asks their father for something six times in a row? Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. What? But that's not how God reacted when Abraham asked to spare the city. Instead, every single time... God listened to Abraham's prayer and he gave Abraham a promise. A promise to not destroy the city if a certain number of believers lived in that city. The only problem with that prayer is we know that there weren't ten believers living in that city. There were only four. And so now God was no longer bound to spare the city. He was allowed to destroy the city and do his will to punish the wicked people living there. The only thing is, he also answered Abraham's prayer. On the surface, it looks like he did. Obviously, the city was destroyed, and that's not what Abraham wanted. But when you dig a little deeper, God answered Abraham's prayer in a way that Abraham never even knew he wanted. Abraham wasn't praying to spare the city for the sake of the city. He was praying for the sake of the righteous people living in those cities. God recognized this. And so when God destroyed the city, he also rescued the righteous people out of that city. God answered Abraham's prayer. But the crazy part is that Abraham may have never known. Because as the sun rose on those two cities and God rained down flaming rocks from the sky onto them, the Bible doesn't say that Abraham ever found out that his relatives were spared. Abraham may have gone his entire life not knowing if his prayer had been answered. He certainly saw the death and destruction, but he doesn't know his family was there. That's a very real possibility for this text. So what can we learn from this? Pray. First and foremost, pray. Because you have a Heavenly Father who loves you dearly. Not 
Not only has he saved you, but he also promises to listen to you and to answer your prayer. The answer might be a yes. It might be a no. The answer might be something that you will never know. And sometimes, God will give you what you wanted just in a way that you never knew you wanted it. But no matter what, we can rest secure in the knowledge that whatever happens, the Lord's will is done. Amen. Please stand. Now the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated for hymn 278.
Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church of God throughout the world, that God, the Almighty Father, gather and guide it, so that we may worship him in peace and tranquility. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. Guide the work of the church, help it to preserve, persevere in faith, proclaim your word, and bring salvation to people everywhere. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our pastors and teachers and all leaders of the church and for all people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold all who serve you and your people. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church. Help each of us to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who do not believe in Christ, that the light of the Holy Spirit may show them the way to salvation. Almighty and eternal God, enable those who do not acknowledge Christ to receive the truth of the gospel. Help us, your church, to grow in love for you and for one another, so that we become more perfect witnesses of your love for all the people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who serve in public office, that God may guide their minds and hearts, so that all of us may live in true peace and freedom. Almighty and eternal God, graciously direct those who have been set in positions of authority among us, so that the people everywhere may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray that God, the almighty and merciful Father, may heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, and free those unjustly deprived of liberty. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. In your mercy, hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O God, through Jesus' sacrifice, you have restored us as your forgiven children. In his name we pray. Amen. Help us to know you through your inspired word and to live according to it as children in your family. Help be your name. Give us your Holy Spirit to rule in our hearts as your faithful people and use us to extend your kingdom of grace to others. Your kingdom come. Make us zealous to live according to your will as the angels in heaven do so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature might not distract us from the path to glory. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Merciful Lord, since you are the provider of all things necessary for our bodies, fill us with trust, contentment, and thankfulness. Give us today our daily bread. Continue to blot out our iniquities and help us gladly to forgive and do good to those who wrong us. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. We know the devil seeks to destroy our souls, and the world lures us to ruin by appealing to the desires of our flesh. Grant us strength to resist all temptation and the trap of unrepentant sin. Lead us not into temptation. Keep our bodies and souls safe, and above all, send the Holy Spirit to preserve our faith in Christ which leads to life everlasting, where we will be delivered from all evil forever. But deliver us from evil. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. For all these petitions, we look to you as King of kings and Lord of lords. You alone hold the power to grant our request, and we worship you from whom all blessings flow. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Relying on Jesus, who canceled our sins and made us acceptable in your sight, we pray with confidence. Amen. It shall be so. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and 
be with him 407.
morning to all of you. A special welcome to our guests and visitors. Certainly glad to have you here with us today. Uh, please take a few minutes to look over the announcements. Uh, one, I'd like to thank uh, Carl for his message this morning. It was wonderful. I think we would all agree. And we ask God's blessings in the coming year as he finishes out his last year at the seminary of the Scottsdale Lutheran Seminary. <laughs> A uh, reminder, we have a quarterly meeting, our voters meeting, right after the service here. We'll excuse everybody. If you wanted to stay seated, that's fine. But those who uh, will excuse everyone and come back in right away. And it should hopefully be a short meeting. Um, Vacation Bible School, this is coming Saturday. So please invite friends, neighbors, and we'll have a tasty treat of God's Word. Uh, you notice also, some of you may remember Steve Iverson to sit over there where the Peters are sitting, him and his wife, Laura. Um, he was only here for a short time as our member. He, as you noticed, he was called to his eternal home uh, last week. Uh, he had been suffering from Alzheimer's. I talked to his wife, Laura. The last few number months, he was pretty much not even speaking, but it's interesting. He said the one time he would speak is when they say the Lord's Prayer together. Otherwise, he did not speak was able to say the Lord's Prayer. So his uh, remembrance is this afternoon. Uh, if you want to send Laura some condolences, information is on the bulletin board. God's peace be with you. I just want to let everyone know that my favorite sister yes. and her husband are with us today, Laura and Maya. All right. Glad to have you here today. The favorite one, huh? Favorite. Oh. Favorite. <laughs> I have a favorite sister like that too. She's my favorite. God's peace be with you.